takes a minute to get going. All right. Hello. All right. Hello and welcome everyone to day two of our Skid Compass Summit. Yesterday during the opening session, you heard me talk about kind of what's to come for Skid as our Skid Compass funding through HRSA is coming to a close. I kind of teased a little bit about a California Skid program and shared a bit about a survey that they would like everyone to take. So today, uh, Dr. Morna Dorsey at UCSF is here to share a long term follow up project called Cal Skid with you all. So I would like to welcome Dr. Dorsey. Hello, everybody. It's great for me to be here with all of you. Um, certainly like to thank the organizers, um, Alyssa Kramer, Emma Mertens, and everyone at IDF and Skid Compass for inviting me to speak to you today about what's to come, long-term follow-up, uh, and CalSkid. So in particular, what I'd like to accomplish today is to pose questions that exist regarding long-term follow-up and what we hope to answer with the CalSkid program. Um, and then describe CalSkid, the organization of it and our objectives. Um, and then I'd like to touch on some of what we are focusing on as we develop this um, SCID-specific long-term follow-up program. And specifically the areas um, of needs assessment, health specific outcomes, data sharing and education. And um, at the end, you'll meet one of our fellows working on the project, um, Dr. Kelsey Ige. Uh, she'll share with you uh, some thoughts on, on the needs assessment survey uh, that's currently live. Uh, and then we'll talk about next steps and, and some concluding remarks. So as we begin this conversation, it's helpful to reference the SCID journey map, uh, which many of you are very familiar with. Um, it's filled with numerous milestones um, and very challenging life events. And this image was really meant to highlight some of those, um, including the first phone call when families receive very difficult news. It's followed by a whirlwind of emotions and stresses. Um, and then you reach transplant, either allogeneic transplant or autologous transplant with gene corrected cells, or in some situations, enzyme replacement um, therapy. Uh, and then you go home and you enter the new normal. Um, but life, of course, goes, goes on after that. Uh, and there are numerous challenges that um, skid um, individuals and families face after the initial treatment. So is, there is general consensus around what happens during the first year or two uh, of diagnosis, but, but very little is known about what happens in the subsequent many years after treatment in the long term. That said, there's no consensus on what skid long-term follow-up actually means. Um, you know, when does it start? Um, the Children's Oncology Group defines long-term follow-up uh, as two years after completion of therapy. Uh, and this definition has been unofficially used for SCID patients because it's the transplant folks and the hemonc team who typically conducts the definitive therapy. However, this does not capture treatment and also doesn't capture early experience before treatment, which can be long and can be arduous for, for some conditions. Uh, and including ADA skid where enzyme therapy is, is a really a bridge to the definitive treatment of gene therapy or, or BMT. Um, a second definition comes from the federal agency that makes recommendations about newborn screen. Um, and it defines um, uh, long-term follow-up as treatment and management following newborn screen diagnosis and referral. Um, this is more favorable, um, um, however, it also doesn't entirely, um, you know, capture the diagnostic journey, which can also be very prolonged in some patients. And then there's the question of when does long-term follow-up end? Um, and, um, and then it's not entirely clear what long-term follow-up should entail. 
Uh, I think most centers will have similar protocols for early management um, uh, developed again by BMT or HEMONC, uh, but no SCID specific consensus pathway for follow up beyond definitive therapy um, has been established. Um, and so we can ask ourselves, why is long term follow up important? Well, SCID is is rare and we need aggregate data. Um, we need uh, lots of, of data points to be able to examine outcomes. Um, we know that SCID is heterogeneous. Even within genotypes, we see differences in outcomes depending on the presence of infection, um, the type of donor, the type of conditioning used, if any. And really, care is received in diverse settings. Um, uh, there are different transplant approaches, uh, different treatment approaches, depending on different centers. And so there really is an incomplete understanding of how factors um, such as treatment pathways, type of SCID, uh, can impact long-term outcomes. And so um, we're fortunate to have broad support for developing um, a long-term follow-up program in California. Um, and so what we've done is we've sort of um, formed a coalition of six um, SCID newborn screen area service referral centers. So these are centers that receive abnormal SCID newborn screening um, uh, information um, and then sort of review confirmatory testing. Um, and our six centers make up um, almost the entirety of all the immunologists and transplant physicians in terms of centers who handle uh, patients uh, with SCID and also um, uh, report on abnormal SCID newborn screening findings. Um, so what we're doing is having formed this consortium, we're going to develop and pilot a SCID long-term follow-up um, program. And so um, the centers are our center. Um, we have Manish Butte at UCLA, Victoria Dimitriadis at UC Davis, um, Dave Bookbinder um, at Children's Hospital Orange County, uh, UC Irvine, Kathy Collins at Rady Children's University of California, San Diego, Ami Shaw and Sean McGee at Stanford. Um, and then our partners in this are um, the California Department of Public Health, um, the Immune Deficiency Foundation, the Primary Immune Deficiency Treatment Consortium, Skid Angels for Life, um, and NBSTRN, which is our data sharing partner. And this is a HRSA funded effort. The collaboration is facilitated by the fact that the state newborn screening program, um, thanks to uh, the wisdom of those who established good newborn screening in California, including uh, Jennifer Puck and the, um, and the CDPH, incorporates confirmatory flow cytometry testing um, into the state screening. And remember, the flow cytometry uh, enumerates the lymphocytes. Um, and because we have this sort of data all linked together, it allows the process of screening and identification to become much more uniform and has organically encouraged centers to share best practices. So even before we really formed this um, consortium, you know, we were sharing best practices about approaches um, between our centers. And over the last several months, um, CalSCID in meeting biweekly has been tackling the questions that we posed just a moment ago. You know, when does um, SCID long-term follow-up start? We believe that long-term follow-up begins following referral from the state newborn screening um, center uh, to, to um, uh, state identified immunology centers of excellence. When does it end? Uh, I think um, long-term follow-up should occur throughout the lifetime of an individual of, with skin, and that's one of the goals of developing this program is to um, create medical homes for all individuals with skin 
uh, regardless of treatment type um, or um, uh, age. How do we conduct long-term follow-up? Individuals with SCID should be followed at least yearly um, following definitive treatment and should be seen by immunologists or transplant physicians. And we're gonna be gathering information on who actually is doing this work. Um, is it mostly immunologists or transplant specialists? And at what time point um, do, do those, uh, are those um, patients uh, co-managed? Um, and then finally, we want um, uh, in understanding what long-term follow-up should entail, we, we really look to questions that you have brought us. So you as, as um, individuals with SCID and patients and families um, uh, with um, SCID uh, members, um, you've posed questions to us. Uh, and um, these are some of your questions uh, captured from prior work done by SCID Compass. Um, and you know, your questions are, what are the long-term complications post-treatment? Um, will a child, will my child need special services in school and what kind of services um, can I expect to prepare them for school? What's the likelihood that a patient um, is going to need an additional treatment, that they'll need another stem cell boost? And when is it going to happen in their 20s and their 30s? Um, how often do we need to be checking in with our immunologist, even though things are fine? Uh, do we need to get blood work on a more regular basis? And what are the short-term complications post-treatment that parents should be aware of? And finally, what are, um, are, are the long-term follow-up needs different based on the type of SCID or treatment that they received? And so your questions have become our sort of research focus for CalSCID. And we're focusing on long-term outcomes, we're looking at neurodevelopment and school readiness. Um, we're looking at health specific services that are needed. Are, um, are you know, um, patients uh, needing endocrinology referral or um, uh, do they need a pulmonologist or do they need um, someone to help them in um, neurodevelopment? We wanna know about transition of care experiences because that is part of, of you know, um, taking care of the whole patient is when they become old enough to transition into adult care, how is that process? Um, and you know, uh, are there enough clinicians out there to be able to uh, take care of patients who are older that have SCID and have been treated? Um, and then finally, I think an area that has, has not been explored is that of family well-being. Um, you know, we know that, that when a family uh, brings a child home with SCID, the entire family uh, is affected. Uh, and we want to track what the long-term effects are uh, of, of this. Um, so those are sort of our research-focused questions. To develop a comprehensive family-centered long-term follow-up program, we need input from all stakeholders. And we said, well, let's bring everybody to the table and, um, and, and, and hear about what they think the needs are and what they would envision to be a perfect long-term follow-up program. So we've invited patients and families uh, through the needs assessment survey uh, again. Um, also, uh, on our steering committee, we have members um, that are that are parents of, of children with SCID. Um, we have um, uh, patient advocacy groups um, like IDF SCID Compass. We have a family-centered care expert, Linda Frank, who has been working for decades in the area of developing family-centered care. Um, we've partnered with public health experts in, in the California Department of Public Health um, we have um, um, uh, a SCID um, uh, patient navigator, uh, Xinhua Chen, who is um, really extraordinary in working with, with patients with SCID. So she can bring a perspective of sort of on the ground, day-to-day -day interactions, what do patients need? And then of course, clinicians and investigators from um, each of our um, uh, SCID centers. So next, I'd like to spend some time on how we're actually going to be developing the program. Um, so the project goals are to develop a family-centered approach to long-term follow-up care for SCID 
um, to disseminate findings to families, researchers, providers, and, and you know the general the general public to ultimately inform public policy. Uh, we also want to make sure that we establish medical homes for all uh, individuals with SCID. Um, and so the input is provided by all the stakeholders that I mentioned. Um, and then the major activities include um, conducting the needs assessment, um, piloting the long-term follow-up protocol at, at our centers, capturing the data and sharing the data through REDCap. Um, and then the output will be a program um, that generates new knowledge in the area of long-term outcomes, um, health specific needs, neurodevelopment, family well being, transition of care, as I mentioned. And the overarching deliverable will be to provide family centered long term follow up care, um, creating a national registry that ultimately strengthens partnerships between public health officials, academia, and clinical care. So, um, I'd like to take a moment to describe the needs assessment activity um, because it's the one that is currently active. Um, uh, input from patients and families and healthcare provider, providers um, are, are being captured through uh, surveys that we've disseminated through IDF, SCID Compass, CIS, and PIDTC. Um, so the surveys were developed by our CalSCID investigators with input from the other members that I, that I just um, discussed, including the steering committee. Um, and um, these surveys were first beta tested by a handful of SCID families to make sure that the content um, was appropriate and, and completing the survey was feasible. Um, and um, we will uh, share with you a, a QRL code and um, the link to complete the survey if you happen to be watching this and you haven't. So this is both for uh, patients and families, and then there's one for clinicians and health and healthcare providers. Um, so the protocol will be um, we're fined once we um, collect that information and analyze it. Um, our current protocol that we have developed um, will will be. Uh, some additional details would be added about the types of support services that families are looking for, the types of assessments that we need to include in our protocol. Um, and so that, that will be refined. And then the protocol will be implemented uh, at the CalSCID um, centers. Um, so the, you know, just going into a little bit more detail about the surveys, the patient and family surveys um, focus on informational, um, emotional, and financial needs. It also contains questions about development, um, uh, whether uh, um, families feel they have a medical home, access to care and barriers to care, and their experience with transition to care if they have gone through that process. The healthcare provider survey will focus on um, current practices, um, how they handle transition of care, what are the barriers to care, uh, delivering care, um, how they evaluate patients, whether they use developmental or well-being assessments, and any sort of informational needs, because the outcome of this is that we also want to create um, content information for providers um, so, that, so that they are uh, become more knowledgeable in the areas that families um, um, are, are interested in um, getting information. So um, part of this is not only families, but also healthcare providers, informational needs. So next I'd like to touch on some of the health specific outcomes that CalSCID will focus on. Um, and, you know, really to date, um, the focus for SCID has been on survival and less about outcomes beyond survival. And that's really because SCID is considered a medical emergency. And before the era of newborn screening, uh, and I have been witness to, to both sides of that coin, um, most SCID patients were identified um, with severe, after severe infection, and the focus was on immediate survival. And so with early identification, through um, newborn screening, transplants are being conducted in a more controlled setting. 
Um, uh, you know, I mentioned, I'd like to mention Jen Heimel's paper that she published a few years ago now um, uh, that describes some of the important late effects to look for and highlighted the need for long-term follow-up uh, to answer, answer the question of how long does the new, new immune system last? Um, you know, we know some patients will need a second transplant or a stem cell boost years after transplant, and some, some don't. Um, and through remarkable efforts of the PIDTC, we've really begun to get an understanding of successful early immune reconstitution. Um, you know, Ellie Haddad in 2018 conducted landmarks, uh, a landmark study that, that identified specific CD4 counts um, that, that were associated with improved survival um, and specific CD4 naive cell counts that were associated with improved immune reconstitution. So we're really getting into the nitty gritty of understanding sort of early um, outcomes for skin. But we also want to know more about the durability of the immune system beyond the immediate transplant time point. And, and you know, what are the later predictors of waning immunity? Um, and, and we want to be able to create guidelines for frequency and type of immune ev evaluation um, needed. Um, we also want to know how novel treatment impacts immune function. So, you know, in the, in, um, the newborn screen era, um, two main reasons for skid mortality have been identified, CMV infection and sinusoidal obstructive syndrome, or SOS. Um, there are novel therapeutic clinical trials ongoing using, you know, lentiviral gene insertion therapy and other therapies such as anti-CK antibodies. Um, uh, as an approach to avoiding um, toxicity from busulfan. Um, and so these outcomes really need to be captured to understand how these treatments impact health specific outcomes and, and immune function. We also want to know um, how long IgG replacement is needed and what are the criteria for trialing off of IgG? And is it, it's currently not standardized across um, centers. Each center will have their own uh, approach to it. Um, uh, but we want to know more about um, what we can anticipate about uh, B cell function so we can inform families about what their life is going to be like. Um, let's talk a moment about health specific outcomes beyond immune reconstitution. Um, we're going to be capturing these elements as part of the case report forms. And we'll be looking at whether patients um, uh, you know, are being followed by specific subspecialties. Um, for instance, we know that ADA skid patients and those with CMV infection are at increased risk of hearing impairment and therefore followed by audiology. Endocrine services are needed more frequently in radiation sensitive skid um, patients exposed to alkylators. They also may have um, linear growth problems. Um, we want to understand when genetics teams are being consulted, and especially if genetics consultations consultation is offered to families early on in diagnosis and then um, whether it's offered to patients when they be, once they become um, uh, once they enter childbearing age. Um, and, you know, we're finding that there is uh, a lack of information um, uh, and that genetics um, uh, is an important um, subspecialty uh, for families, um, especially when patients get older. Um, we also know that recurring infections can you know, still affect skid patients um, following transplants. Um, we, you know, we think about HPV infection and pulmonary infections. So um, uh, some of the subspecialists uh, that follow these conditions, of course, are infectious disease specialists. Um, so we wanna know about who is part of the care team for, for patients with skid at different time points throughout their lifetime. Um, and then um, we also want to look at um, specifically neurodevelopment as a health-specific outcome. Um, 
you know, prior to newborn screening, patients often presented, as I mentioned, with, with life, serious life-threatening infections, including meningitis. And therefore, it's important to understand whether newborn screening has decreased the negative impact of delayed diagnosis and treatment. Um, less clear are the extent and causes of neurocognitive and emotional impairments in childhood. Um, although both infections such as meningitis and um, you know, infantile exposure to chemotherapy are associated with these kinds of sequelae. Um, currently, there, there is a personalized um, personalization of tissue exposure to busulfan uh, rather than you know, regular dosing um, to minimize the amount of chemotherapy exposure and potentially neurotoxic effects. Um, because some of the early prior studies demonstrated very sort of high, highly variable uh, metabolism of uh, busulfan in small uh, infants. Um, and, and there's a positive literature on outcomes following transplant and the impact on neurocognitive development and different skid genotypes and conditioning regimens. So there's a lot of work in uh, personalizing medicine uh, and understanding how this personalization um, can improve neurocognitive um, outcomes. Neurocognitive outcomes are different depending on type of skid. Um, we know that, you know, for instance, ADHD exists in ADA skid uh, more commonly, um, CMV associated um, with hearing loss and blindness. Um, and we want to know if enzyme replacement therapy versus allogeneic transplant versus gene therapy has different impact on neurodevelopment. Um, uh, and as part of the long-term follow-up program, we'll be capturing data using standardized surveys um, uh, to, to um, uh, understand the neurodevelopmental status uh, of the patients. But these will, be, these will not be formal neurodevelopmental assessments conducted by specialists. Um, and, and that is, which is really the focus of the PIDTC study that's currently ongoing in school-age children. So it's a little bit different, not as rigorous, not as intense, but really trying to get more of a general idea of, of neurodevelopmental outcomes. Finally, we wanna know about school readiness, um, how to provide guidance on a, a 504 plan, an IEP plan, and resources that might be available to, to families as their child gets older and begins to, to enter school. Okay, so moving on to family well-being. Um, you know, a happy family means a happy child, and, and we want to understand more about the stressors during the skid journey. I think we're beginning to really understand what those stressors are in the first months and, and maybe first year after diagnosis, but very little is known about the, what the stresses are in the long term. And what we want to do is, is find ways to lessen the psychological trauma and promote well-being in, in families. We want to know about resilience. Um, uh, Post-traumatic growth is an important part of the skid journey. And we want to ensure that, that we can promote that to improve um, outcomes for families. So to do this, we'll be conducting surveys that capture the following domains. Um, um, Post-traumatic um, stress will be assessed. In early studies at our center, we were surprised to find increasing symptoms of post-traumatic stress following discharge from the hospital, up to one year uh, post-discharge from the hospital. Um, both mothers and fathers can experience postnatal depression, and this is heightened when typical bonding activities become interrupted, such as um, breastfeeding cessation. We want to be able to identify families that have a greater psychosocial vulnerability early on and to give them the support services um, uh, early on. So that's part of the baseline um, psychosocial vulnerability assessment. Our wonderful CalSkid patient navigator, Xinhua Chen, um, who has cared for skid family members for many years, is developing a set of tools to be deployed um, 
by each site's uh, clinical care team. So, um, you know, uh, this clinical care team could involve social workers, patient care coordinators, discharge coordinators um, to, to, to provide um, support, um, to give them anticipatory guidance and then le lessen the psychosocial impact. Um, the toolkit will have uh, kind of a menu of support services um, and including access to mental health services, spiritual support, um, uh, respite care, um, because, you know, needs are different at different time points. You know, at the beginning when you're hearing about SCID, you don't probably think about any of this stuff, but maybe six months, a year, two, three, five, ten years uh, um, uh, post-treatment, things change, priorities change, needs change. So, um, so I think it's important to have sort of a menu where you can choose what you need at specific um, time points. And to assess its effectiveness, we'll have a patient satisfaction report um, with, with a focus on patient access to support services and understanding of the care, of the care plan. So I want to mention um, this kind of disconnect that can occur between um, families and, and, and the healthcare team. Um, uh, Heather Smith and the IDF and PIDCC submitted a, an impactful paper really, which for the first time describes the discordance that has been reported um, uh, you know, between family expectations for life after SCID and the actual day-to-day -day life that becomes the new normal. Um, and specifically differences were identified in what families reported uh, or you know, really remembered hearing versus what the providers believed that they'd said to them, um, even in, um, you know, during extensive conversations um, uh, when consent was being obtained, for instance, for, for gene therapy or, or BMT. Um, and the malalignment that exists is in part due to the lack of long-term follow-up information to accurately inform patients about what life will resemble um, following definitive treatment. Um, so that, that is certainly an area of focus to make sure that we start aligning what families hear and, and what we're saying, um, and so that we're all on the same page. Ultimately, for each new patient, we want to provide something that looks like this, um, which is, you know, um, uh, basically a, a patient persona. And this is in order to provide personalized communication. Uh, and this will include some background um, goals, habits, and communication styles. Um, uh, and, you know, understanding the patient's persona will allow us to use the correct, the preferred method of um, delivering information that might be auditory, visual, or animation. Um, it also will help align what the goals are of the patient uh, with what our goals are as, as healthcare providers. Um, uh, so another effort to really kind of personalize care. Um, and then finally, we will share um, REDCap data that we capture through uh, um, our, our, you know, our activity through, through CalSCID. Um, and we'll be sharing non-identifiable aggregate data through the NBSTRN. Um, the longitudinal pediatric data resource is a suite of of uh, informa information technology tools that help to support newborn screening researchers in general. Um, and the LPDR enables longitudinal collection of clinical and research information uh, on a, in a secure environment that um, allows data sharing uh, to research teams. Um, and the majority of, uh, because the new, majority of newborn screen conditions are rare, translating sort of newer discoveries into direct clinical practice re requires a lot of aggregate data and sharing of, of health information. Um, and so, um, 
the the goals of um, the NVS TRN and the LPDR are to capture national data to understand national uh, natural history, um, to promote hypothesis driven investigation, um, to promote um, surveillance and quality improvement in the public health domain, uh, and then finally to um, uh, improve healthcare quality uh, across all patients by creating certain benchmarks that can be uh, implemented at different sites. Lastly, I want to spend some time um, as I describe the, uh, the CalSCID consortium, um, uh, I want to spend some time about education. Uh, it is one of the outputs that we are proposing as part of CalSCID. Um, one of the biggest barriers to providing care for SCID patients and inborn errors of immunity in general is the shortage of knowledgeable clinicians who feel comfortable about taking care of patients with immune defects. Um, and, and therefore, a concerted effort is needed to educate young trainees who will become the next generation of immunologists who will be caring for SCID patients as SCID patients uh, become older. Um, and, uh, you know, we need um, clinicians, uh, we need investigators who are familiar uh, with the intricacies of the disease and the treatment that they received uh, in order to, to provide uh, the utmost level of care. Um, and this is especially important if, if one of our goals is to ensure that all individuals with SCID identify a medical home. Um, we want to have all patients with SCID say, this is my medical home. This is where I go to. I'm not just out there trying to figure out when I'm supposed to, who I'm supposed to see, when I'm supposed to be seen. Um, there is someone there for me uh, to manage my condition. Um, and so we want to train diverse physicians to become leaders in skid health. Um, we want to advance the knowledge base through research embedded in clinical um, community and public health settings with translation and dissemination. And so um, we train one to two immunology fellows per year through participation in case-based presentation of skid cases. Um, I have the pleasure of um, of Kelsey Ige, Dr. Kelsey Ige joining us uh, today. Um, and she is one of the fellows um, who is participating in CalSCID. Um, the three main areas that we've invited um, fellows to uh, get involved in are in the design and analysis of the needs assessment, which Kelsey has done, um, the development of the protocol, and then um, also the, the case-based um, uh, discussion. Um, and then moving on to what's next, because that's really the last part of this talk. We know that SCID newborn screening picks up non-SCID TCL patients in addition to SCID. Uh, and this is data from the Amatuni paper that shows final diagnosis of infants with abnormal TREC screens um, and low T cells who were identified uh, by California SCID newborn scheme screening um, over the course of six and a half years. And we can see that we capture a lot of syndromes other than and other com combined immune disorders, um, some listed here to ataxia, telangiectasia, to George syndrome and others, uh, in addition to um, SCID. And we also have other categories, um, idiopathic T-cell lymphopenia, which over time we can identify a specific um, underlying cause or, or inborn error of, of uh, immunity. Also secondary um, causes of T-cell lymphopenia and preterm being, being preterm uh, can cause T-cell lymphopenia. So the newborn screen picks up all of these other patients in addition to, to SCID. After much deliberation, the CalSCID centers felt it important to follow um, non-SCID TCL patients um, because there is a significant knowledge gap with regard to natural history. Um, the number of children who fall into this category are at least as numerous as those with SCID. And so while TCL conditions are picked up 
um, um, uh, and in, in many instances, um, diagnoses are established early. Um, the benefit of this early detection is really not well established. Um, you know, many TCL conditions, for example, ataxia telangiectasia, <coughs> DOC8 deficiency, and other combined immune deficiencies can result in pretty profound immune deficiency and treatment paradigms. Uh, are much less straightforward than for SCID. Uh, because the natural history of these diseases is variable and the decision to pursue, pursue transplant or other specific treatment requires lots of experience and we need aggregate data. Um, so there's an effort with our centers to, to capture the TCL category um, and these non-SCID um, uh, patients that have CD3 counts uh, less than um, 1,500 and have the presence of naive cells. Um, infants with T cells in this range are considered immunocompromised and live vaccines are not recommended. And so, for instance, early detection might spare a patient with ataxial telangiectasia uh, from exposure to vaccine strain rubella uh, and the development of disfiguring uh, rubella granuloma. Um, so, What's next for us in terms of our um, timeline? Um, we uh, have the needs assessment surveys live currently. Uh, as I mentioned, the patient and family survey through um, IDF Skid Compass. Um, the healthcare provider needs assessment survey has been launched through the Clinical Immunology Society or CIS. So please, please look for that and complete that. Um, we will then finalize the protocol and the case report forums um, in August. Uh, the, um, we will begin patient enrollment um, following training at all sites beginning in September. And we anticipate completion of existing um, uh, patient enrollment by March uh, 23, 2023. So these are all patients with SCID. These are pre-newborn screen, post-newborn screen patients that currently exist um, in, uh, uh, in California that are receiving care at one of the six centers. Um, in May 2024, we'll provide HRSA with reports of the number of SCID patients enrolled in um, a comprehensive long-term follow-up care program and the number of telehealth visits, telehealth visits conducted, because this is an important aspect of um, the mission for HRSA is to um, make sure that we're capturing patients and providing adequate care. So that'll be a checkpoint um, for our data. Uh, and then we'll also complete our um, education content creation. There are a total of six webinars um, that are CalSCID Center. So all the site PIs um, are giving talks ranging from B cell immunity to, you know, and when does IgG replacement stop to late effects uh, and some data coming out of the PIDTC. So that will com be completed by then. Um, and then um, we will share de identified aggregate data to the NBSTRN. Um, to share with investigators and the general public. Um, so the conclusions are the efforts of this project are to provide skid specific care throughout the lifespan um, of patients. We want to inform future research uh, and influence public policy by collecting aggregate data and sharing it with the general public. Um, but ultimately, what we want to do is take better, better care um, of, of our patients. So um, I'd like to conclude with um, acknowledgments. These are all the folks that are involved in this project. Uh, I cannot thank um, uh, those of you listed here enough for all of the uh, collaboration, uh, support, commitment um, to this project, and especially to um, uh, you know, our patients and families. Um, and so I will now stop sharing, maybe, 
uh, and introduce Kelsey Ige. I don't know if you're able to um, to introduce yourself, Kelsey. She is one of our UCSF fellows, and she's just going to say a few words about the um, the this the needs assessment survey. Thanks, Dr. Dorsey. Um, hi, my name is Kelsey Ige, and I am, as Dr. Dorsey said, one of the first year allergy and immunology fellows at UCSF. Um, uh, up here, I'm sure I think Alyssa has already mentioned earlier, but uh, we would love your input as Dr. Dorsey outlined beautifully the different components of our long-term follow-up. And we really, really value patient input as well as healthcare providers, because we want to make sure that um, the program that we develop does meet your needs throughout your whole SCID journey. Um, and so this QR code that we have listed here, um, with the red cap link um, data, if you're unable to scan the QR code, is one that um, is the same survey that has been um, on the IDF website as well as distributed through Skid Angels. Um, just as a reminder, this we are inviting you to participate. Um, the survey is completely anonymous. It's a 15 minute survey. And again, it would provide us with valuable information um, really so we can cater this um, long-term follow-up to your specific needs. Um, the goals of the survey specifically are to understand where you are in your SCID journey, um, resources that you use to learn about SCID, um, resources that you used for emotional support for you and your family, um, as well as financial support. We also want to just know about the growth and development of the child, as well as transitions of care. And lastly, and very importantly, the barriers that you identify that um, prevent you or your child from getting care and how we could alleviate these things. And so uh, as a reminder, the first 200 participants will who complete the survey will receive a $5 gift card. Um, we appreciate those of you who have already completed the survey. Um, and a special thank, thank you to Alyssa, as well as the IDF, um, Skid Angels for Life, CIS, and PADTC, who have all worked um, hard to be able to help us distribute and making sure that we hear all the voices of our patients. Um, we ask that um, each patient complete the survey once. So um, if you're an adult, then um, we get your input um, as well as if you're a parent of a child with SCID, we ask that um, the submission just be one per patient. Um, and I am so thankful for your time. And um, I think that we have some questions coming up too. I just wanted to make a quick mention that this is the other survey that's available through CIS and I think has gone out through the PIDTC. This is for the healthcare provider. So this is your QRL code. And then this is um, the link for that. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you so much, Dr. Dorsey and Kelsey. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, one of them, I think, Kelsey, you answered. Uh, we had a parent who has an adult child with SCID, and she wasn't sure if her adult child should take it and if she, as a parent, should also take it. But it sounds like you just want one survey per patient. Is that correct? Yeah, so if, if the child, if the, um, if the individual with SCID is an adult, then it would be the adult um, SCID individual who would complete it. If it's a minor, then it would be the parent of that child. Very helpful, thank you. And um, there's also somebody who is wondering if you could reshare the link to the healthcare provider survey. I don't know if you can put it back up on the screen. Um, they want to be able to share it if they're not necessarily connected to CIS or PIDTC, they can share it with their providers. Thank you. 
All right, let me hold on, scroll quickly through. There were a couple of other questions. I just want to make sure I get them all. Someone is wondering, how does California Department of Health newborn screening program interact with CalSCID? Do they have a role beyond the notification and receiving the diagnosis back? Yeah, so as part of the, the CalSCID consortium, um, the the genetic disease screening program of um, within the Department of Public Health has provided input on um, all aspects, including uh, the needs assessment survey, the case report forms, because it's important for us to understand what public health officials are interested in capturing, uh, um, because they see newborn screening conditions on a more global level. Uh, so we've worked with them on the case report forms. They're also providing us with um, the cases that they've referred to us. So it's almost like we're going to be able to uh, obtain the baseline number of um, uh, patients that have been referred for uh, SCID evaluation for the, for, for, um, the state of California. Uh, so they are... Um, they are very much involved in, in the process because, as I mentioned, um, what's important is to, to also have representation from the public health standpoint. Um, you know, there are certain metrics that they're interested in, in tracking, um, and we want to be able to make sure that this data can be used by experts in public health as well. Thank you, Dr. Dorsey. I think that is all the questions that I see coming in. Um, so thank you both very much for sharing all of this information. We are so excited about this CalSCID program and kind of what it means for the future of long-term follow-up for SCID. Um, we will make sure that everyone has links to those surveys, both the parent um, and patient one, as well as this healthcare provider survey. So thank you so much for um, logging in on an early morning on a Friday out in California. And I know Kelsey is actually calling in from Hawaii. Wow. So thank you so much for all of your just great dedication. And we are so excited to be partners with you in all of this and um, excited to see kind of where this goes. So thank you thank so you. much. Yes, thank you so much. Have a, have a wonderful day. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.